Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. Quick little note to start this thing off, you might be hearing a soft noise in the background of this video. I got my AC running in the studio today. It is over 90 degrees outside and I'm not gonna be doing this review in this sweatsuit with that heat out there without AC. Sorry, not sorry. Anyway, the action is heating up. It is the summertime, so it's time for a summer tradition. And yes, this review probably should have come out two weeks ago on the 4th of July. Never Nevertheless, it's WCW's Great American Bash 1995 from June 18th at the Hera Arena in Dayton, Ohio, which, side note, was the same venue ECW would hold Heat Waves 98 and 99. So lots of wrestling history here in this building. This show was nominated by Daniel Kingman over on Patreon.com slash Wrestling with Regret. Kind of a historic Great American Bash here in 95. It's the first Great American Bash they've done since 1992, and uh, that show had Vader beating Sting to become the WCW champion as well as the Miracle Violence Connection beating Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham to become the inaugural NWA World Tag Team Champions. I tried to do some research before recording here to try to figure out why there wasn't a Great American Bash in 93 or 94. I'm hearing a lot of different theories and explanations as to why it's the case. The most uh, common one, the one that makes the most sense to me, is the fact that WCW was trying to cut costs, the fact that the last two Great American Bashes in 91 and 92 didn't do so well in terms of of numbers they were doing very badly and so they probably just cut it for just for uh, expediency and to streamline their pay-per-view schedule however by 95 they were upping their pay-per-view schedule here so it probably makes a lot of sense to bring it back also another theory i heard i'm not sure how how true this one is was that maybe they got rid of great american bash because at the time there was a big ted turner edict saying you couldn't basically he was prohibiting any kind of nationalistic language or verbiage on any of his networks american or otherwise that is the reason why for a while the foreign object was to, was renamed to the international object for a time in WCW. Not so sure if the Ted Turner uh, nationalistic language thing is true for why there was no bash in 93 and 94. Maybe there's some kind of comp. Maybe there's a little bit of truth in all these theories. 6,000 people in the Hera Arena on this night, 90,000 pay-per-view buys with a .51 buy rate. And in case you're curious, uh, this Great American Bash was not the worst drawing pay-per-view of the year, unlike the previous two Great American Bashes in 91 and 92. That distinction would go to Starcade 95, the main event of which being Hulk Hogan versus The Butcher. Tony Schiavone and Bobby Heenan are on commentary for the evening. Your opening match is Flying Brian Pillman versus Alex Wright. It's a face versus face battle. A couple of young high flyers, very action packed you're about to see here. Very respectable opening. Much sportsmanship early on. Great technical wrestling early on between the two young men. Pillman with a lovely bow and arrow submission. Wright tries to go for a surfboard soon afterward, but he doesn't quite pull it off. After several minutes of nice clean wrestling between the two of them, Pillman lights up uh, Wright's chest with a big old chop and the crowd just erupts. Alex gets away with fine Brian comes out with the first shot. The commentary for this match is almost a bit too distracting because Heenan is, of course, a heel announcer here, but he is really going full force, jumping Jeff Farmer style on both of these guys in terms of him healing on them, especially Alex Wright for whatever reason. Pillman picks up Wright like a sack of potatoes at one point, just drops him. It could have been a bit of very bad landing for Wright there. Big suplex to the outside by Wright, but I can't help but notice for the first time in this night, somebody in the front row brought an Al Snow sign to a WCW event in 1995. Must be some big Smoky Mountain fans in attendance here. The guy Guys are taken to the air, tit for tat. Brian dives to the outside but eats the barricade. Wright goes for a dive, face plants on the canvas. Diving cross body by Wright. Pillman intercepts a diving attack with a drop kick. Pillman's crotch on the top rope, and oh my god, these guys just killing it out there. Pillman goes for a head scissors, but Alex blocks it, sits on him for a pin. Wright wins the match, clean as a whistle. This was a fantastic opener. I give it three and a half stars out of four. Just it's a great match because it starts off going really slow. They're working kind of this this a uh, lower paced, technical ground-based style. And with every passing moment, it just keeps ramping up in the action and what they're doing. It's a very natural progression. Nothing feels forced. And just by the end, they're just going hell for leather, just diving on each other, all these big flying moves, living up to their potential and, and what the hype is about them in the ring at the time. And yeah, a very satisfying finish. I have no complaints about this match. And with that great match out of the way, it's time to bring the mood down a little bit because it's time for a good old-fashioned arm wrestling match as Diamond Dallas Page takes on Dave Sullivan's 
slash Evad Sullivan, the dyslexic brother of Kevin Sullivan, the Taskmaster. So yeah, uh, DDP claims to be an arm wrestling champion. According to his words, the international big arm arm wrestling world champion. And so for weeks and weeks, DDP is going around from town to town uh, challenging uh, common folk to arm wrestling matches, and he wins every one of them. He's got his friend Max Muscle helping him out more often than not, helping provide leverage and also helping sweep the leg of wrestlers uh, when the referee's not looking. So DDP is definitely getting this arm wrestling thing over. I love that in the promo package they're showing for this. Every time DDP wins, like he makes a, he says bang every time he wins. Can you imagine if that would have been his gimmick like in the late 90s? Instead of doing like the diamond cutter, he's just like doing bang, bang, arm wrestling. Just imagine the yoga DVDs. By the way, this is a double stipulation arm wrestling contest. If Evad wins here, he goes on a date with the diamond doll, aka Kimberly. And if DDP wins, he takes Evad's pet rabbit Ralph and throws him in the stew. Uh, I love Evad's theme here. I think I've mentioned it before on this channel. The fact that he basically got the theme, his theme song for a while was I Want to Be a Hulkamaniac from the Hulk Rules album. Although over time, apparently, they just changed, they modified the theme ever so slightly. So the theme here, at least on the network version, I don't think this is a network dub. I think this is just what they did to change it from I Want to Be a Hulkamaniac, just that opening da -da 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 -da. Da -da 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 on a continuous endless loop, which is forever. I was waiting for the for the hook to drop. And go, I want to be a Hulkamaniac. Didn't quite happen. Not much to say about the action here. It's your standard fare, your standard shtick when it comes to arm wrestling contests in the grand history of professional wrestling, where, you know, the heel, like, balks, and they have all these false starts, and then eventually they get into it, and it's very competitive, and, you know, Max Muscle's trying to help Paige some more, but he gets thwarted by the referee, and then we get this moment here where Paige loses his balance, Dave wins the arm wrestling contest, so he gets a date with the Diamond Diamond Doll, yay for Evad. And then Tony Schiavone says on commentary, well, maybe the Diamond Doll bumped into DDP and that's why he lost his bounce. And I'll take his word for it because in the live shot of what you see, you don't see anyone bump into DDP. In the replay, you do finally see uh, Kimberly bump into Max Muscle, who bumps into DDP and that's what causes him to lose. My favorite part is when Heenan and Schiavone look at the replay and they both go, she buh, she buh, she buh. Bumps into her. Oh, she, she bumps it. She he, bumped. He bumped. She, she bumped. I don't know if I want to give this a rating per se because this is a very different kind of match from everything else going on in the show. It's not a wrestling match. It's an arm wrestling contest. It's a big gimmick thing. If I had to give it a rating, I'd probably just give it like a half star. I don't think it's fair to give it like a zero star treatment because, you know, at least it was, you know, it was a well done arm wrestling contest about as well as you could do, but there's kind of a ceiling on that. So half star is probably the best I could possibly give it. After the match, DDP is just, he's throwing a shit fit. He's going crazy. He wants a do over. Of course, it won't be long now before he loses all his millions of dollars that he one, and he looks like a, basically a taller version of Enzo Amore come uncensored 1996. Up next, a very all-American matchup for the Great American Bash as Hacksaw Jim Duggan takes on Sergeant Craig Pittman. Interesting couple of notes about this particular matchup. First of all, Pittman is already working double duty on this show because he wrestled a match in the pre-show before this. Second of all, and more interesting, I think, is the fact that uh, Duggan is actually a last-minute replacement for Marcus Alexander Bagwell, the future buff Bagwell, uh, because Bagwell got an infection in his calf implants. Uh, only in wrestling will you hear a story of that. Actually, only for Buff Bagwell will you hear a story of somebody's calf implants causing them to be on the shelf. There's an awful lot of shtick in this match. A lot of pantomime and walking around, and there's a little bit of wrestling. Uh, long story short, though, not a whole lot of bumping between either guy. I will say, the one thing that really that I remember the most about this matchup is Pittman's bumping ability when he goes out of the ring. At one point, he hurls himself out of the ring. It clears the steps on that side of the ring before he falls. Uh, I don't know if that was like a last-minute redirection or what, because he lands on his feet kind of weird before or falling uh, completely, but man, that was very, uh, it was cool to see him be so nimble and go out of the ring like that. Also, one part makes me laugh, because at one point in the match, uh, Pittman's really working Duggan's leg. He rips off Duggan's knee pad, really working the leg over. He's got him in a spinning toe hold. Duggan, like, rolls out of it or shrugs Pittman off, and Pittman, like, completely changes direction and then throws himself out of the ring. It's just this crazy non, uh, it, it doesn't make any sense from a physical standpoint how he made that move. So Duggan finally makes his big comeback, but Pittman no-sells the three-point stance. He grabs Duggan by the arm for his code red armbar submission, his finisher they're trying to put over here. Duggan grabs the ropes. Uh, Pittman does not release the hold as the referee's counting, so Pittman's disqualified. The match is over. And one of the big hangups I have with this match is if you're working the leg for several agonizing minutes, why would you then switch to the armbar as your finisher and have that be the finish of the match? Now, granted, in if you were in a real fight or something, you can work the leg a lot, and then you know the armbar can still be a very devastating hold, so take whatever limb you can to get the advantage. Like, I get that from that kind of psychology standpoint, but it would make so much more sense 
because they're trying to put over the code red and they're trying to put over the story that Pittman is this like killer. He doesn't care who he hurts for reals or whatever with the code red submission. It's very specific about that. So maybe work the arm a little more going to the code red instead of the leg. I give the match a half star out of four, uh, you know, except for the wild bumps by Pittman. Really, this match isn't that interesting. It starts out slow and gets slower and more boring with every passing minute with kind of a confusing finish. Backstage, Mean Gene Okerlund interviews the Blue Bloods. Lord Steven Regal makes a reference to Hitler and Goebbels in their final moments in World War II and how they blew it, just like the Nasty Boys blew it. And they're going to lose the tag titles tonight. Okay, and I, I mean, I know the Nasty Boys aren't that great, but I wouldn't really compare them to Hitler. It's a bit of a jump. Anyway, uh, Stephen Regal, he re de definitely weaves a yarn here with this promo and takes all of Robert Earl of Eaton's time. Our next match is a bonus match that was added after the pre-show on this night as Harlem Heat, who are accompanied by Sister Sherry, take on the stud stable members Buckhouse Buck and Dirty Dick Slater, who are accompanied by Colonel Robert Parker. Like I said, this match was added after the pre-show. We had some interview time between the two teams. Colonel Robert Parker straight up assaults Sister Sherry, and she hits him right in the mush in response. And so the match starts out as a big brawl here, then a wrestling match breaks out. Harlem Heat getting a lot of offense in. I'm just waiting for the cutoff, but it takes so friggin' long. It just goes, it goes on and on and on and on. Uh, Booker T busts out a spinner Rooney. Uh, they don't call it that yet, though, and the fans don't they don't respond to it because it's not really over yet. But he's doing the spinner Rooney as early as 1995. Uh, Stevie's dumped out and thrown into the ring post, so the heels finally get their shine, but it doesn't last very long. Booker with the hot tag, and the crowd's pretty apathetic to everything. Booker rolls up Bunkhouse Buck in a small package. Parker gets in the ring and then changes the momentum, so Buck is on top. And then after what feels like forever, and this the referee is distracted, by the way. Well, this is all going on. Then Sister Sherry gets in the ring, turns him back over, so Booker's back on top. The referee finally sees what's going on. Three count, and Harlem Heat win the day. I give this match one star out of four. Uh, kind of like how the opening match with Pillman and Wright was a face versus face match. This one's kind of a heel versus heel match. Harlem Heat are on their way to becoming baby faces, but they're not quite there yet. So the crowd's pretty apathetic about a heel versus heel matchup in this case. Really the conflict, I think what people want to see here is the conflict between Sherry and Parker. We don't really get that in this particular matchup. This will this is the opening salvo of what will become a very long-standing on-again, off-again, on-air relationship between Sherry and Parker. The high point of which is when they try to get married at the, uh, coincidentally, the same Vegas chapel that Triple H married Stephanie McMahon at the end of 1999, and uh, but then it gets all it go, go, gets sabotaged. Medusa comes in and, and ruins the party. But that's pretty much where things are going to go from here between those two teams. We get a replay of what happened during the pre-show when WCW Commissioner Nick Bockwinkle was about to make an address over what's going to happen at Bash the Beach. Vader comes barging out, attacks Nick Bockwinkle, and yells. So Vader's really getting into it with Bockwinkle here, starts shoving him, and then out of nowhere, the WCW champion Hulk Hogan, who's not appearing on the show proper tonight, cracks Vader from behind with the chair. Big old brawl, big pull apart thing, and so nothing is really uh, resolved or announced. So instead of having an announcement uh, for Bash the Beach on the free show, you gotta pay to find out what's gonna happen at Bash the Beach next month. So do a do-over. Bockwinkle is at the announce booth with Shivani and Heenan, and he says, next month at the, uh, Gosh, what's the name of that next pay-per-view? I don't know. And so at Bash the Beach, he announces that Hogan and Vader are going to fight for the championship in a steel cage. That's the gist of what this announcement by Bachwinkle was going to be. Two things I want to point out, though, about this moment here. Allegedly, it was that flub that Bachwinkle had where he couldn't remember the name of the pay-per-view that got him fired as an on-air commissioner from WCW, which is kind of unfortunate because that whole promo, he was very articulate and very eloquent like he always was, but then he has this one slip-up. And granted, it's a kind of a big slip-up. If you're the commissioner, you should really know the name of your pay-per-view. Also, one little thing I noticed was just the gleam in Bobby Heenan's eyes as he's standing behind Bockwinkle as he's making his address. These two had a very long, successful relationship in the AWA, so they're kind of reunited here. They don't bring up their history together in AWA when Bockwinkle's working for WCW, but just kind of cool to see him on stage together and Heenan's eyes just lighting up as Bockwinkle's as, as he's telling his tale. We then go to a Ric Flair promo backstage where he basically screams his entire promo at Randy Savage. He briefly mentions their history back in 1992 and he even runs down Papa Poffo who uh, Flair even beat up last month at Slambury. More on that later. Television championship match up next as the enforcer Arn Anderson defends against the Renegade. Now, if you saw my review about the Ultimate Warrior in WCW a couple of years ago, then you know the Renegade was WCW's very, very incorrect answer to the Ultimate Warrior. Uh, Hulk Hogan and Jimmy Hart bring the Renegade in at the end of Uncensored 95 as kind of an insurance policy against Vader. And so he's just kind of hanging around Hart and Hogan for a little while. And this is his first championship match, actually. 
actually. He is somehow worse than the Ultimate Warrior, because at least the Warrior had charisma. He has like a presence about him. And he also has a better physique. The Renegade does not have Warrior's physique, does not have his energy, does not have his charisma. He basically just grunts and yells all the time, which is not a substitute for what the Ultimate Warrior does. Uh, early in the match, Renegade tries for a corner clothesline or avalanche. It doesn't go over, basically. Renegade screaming and grunting as he applies the headlock for a very long time. Arn counters into an abdominal stretch. Renegade no-sells Arn's in Zaguri, and Arn's got a powder in fear and trying to put that over. Eventually, he gets the advantage, though. There's an ugly application of Arn's sleeper after a wild elbow right to the Renegade's dome. A chin lock on Renegade. He powers out and almost fucks up the double-A spine buster. He's putting his head down as Arn Arn's putting his head down to pick up the Renegade. How damn green is this kid? Arn finds himself on the top turnbuckle laying down. Renegade slams him off his shoulders. A top rope splash, probably the best move Renegade does all night. He wins and is the new television champion. I give this match zero stars out of four. Yes, I know. I too am shocked that a match featuring Arn Anderson is getting a zero star rating. But look at what the poor bastard's working with here. I, God bless Arn. God bless AA, because I'm sure he tried his best to make the Renegade look good. But at every single turn, Renegade found some new and innovative way to fuck something up and make even the most basic move look like shit and possibly hurt himself or somebody else. It was not a good look for the Renegade. Like I said, Arn tried his best, I know. But, you know, at the very least, you're not going to find another match featuring Arn that's this bad. After the match on the corner, Renegade gestures to someone in the crowd, and it's the Giant. This is either one of the first, if not the first, appearances of Paul White in WCW as he would appear in the crowd early on uh, for a couple of months, and basically he would eventually you know, join the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan, in his quest to end Hulkamania. Watch my Dungeon of Doom review if you want some more information on that. Mean Gene is backstage with the WCW Tag Team Champions, the Nasty Boys, and Brian Knobs is screaming, We're representing America! We're going to show those Brits what class is all about! Loud noises! Go watch the XWF! That tag title match is up next as the Nasty Boys defend against the Blue Bloods, Lord Steven Regal and Robert Earl of Eaton, formerly just Bobby Eaton. It's a big old war with the tag titles. Harlem Heat's also been involved in this battle with the two teams, but really they've been kind of like side characters here. The real feud has been the Nasties versus the Blue Bloods. Uh, the Blue Bloods try and jump the champs during the entrance, but it turns into a big old fight. I love the sign of someone in the front row is holding. Bloody good wallop, sir. Lord Steve gets the pit stop and does like the best best facial expressions afterward. You can always rely on Regal to have the best facial expressions if there's something like gross or weird happens. And really, just that spot alone where Regal's reacting to the pit stop really helps elevate this match. More fighting on the outside. Lord Steve's getting the hell beat out of him for a while until he finally cuts off Nobbs. Nobbs tumbles to the outside. Regal with a version of the cactus elbow off the apron of the floor. Hot diggity, never knew he had it in him. Earl of Eden crotches himself in the corner, which allows Sags to get the hot tag, quote unquote. I'm not sure if this was it or not. Regal throws sags out over the top rope, but the ref misses it, so there's no disqualification. Yes, that is still a thing in 1995 WCW. Double teaming on the outside by the Brits, just blatant at this point. I don't know why the referee's not stopping it. Big ol' flying knee by Robert Earl of Eaton. There's a double down. Suddenly, Harlem Heat and Sister Sherry run in. Booker hits the Harlem hangover on knobs. He also knocks Earl of Eaton off the top turnbuckle, which seemed to not be part of their plan. Basically, it backfires. Sags the diving elbow drop on Bobby Eaton, and the Nasties win and retain the championships. I give this one two stars out of four. Just a big physical match, a lot of brawling, if there's a good story told, and again, Regal's reactions to a lot of the stuff here just is really what helps put it over the top for me. In your semi-man event, a new U.S. champion will be crowned as Sting takes on Ming in the tournament finals. Almost kind of rhymes, Sting and Ming. Anyway, back in April, Vader was stripped of the championship after what Wikipedia describes as multiple violent offenses. Just sounds like he got in a lot of fights with people. Anyway, this is technically one of the semi-final matches. Uh, this is not the actual final match to the tournament bracket, but the other side of that bracket, Savage and Flair, never happens. The match is ruled with no contest when these two fight all the way in the backstage area at center stage, and the match is totally thrown out. So Sting and Meng is your default finals match, so the winner of this match will become the new U.S. champion. Colonel Parker cuts a promo for Meng. Like, it was almost two full minutes of non-stop talking by Parker here, putting over Meng as this just unbeatable killer. Sting gets a promo as well and says that his experience as a champion at all different levels 
is going to put him over the top and help him beat Meng. Meng with the advantage early on with a cheap shot on Sting. Sting fights back, but Meng seems unfazed. Colonel Parker distracts Sting on the apron, which allows Meng to get the cutoff, works him over with lots of nerve holds. Sting finally flips out of a backslide position and jumps off the turnbuckle, launching himself back first into Meng. I've never seen him do that before. It was a really cool move. Sting gets some fire under him and mounts his comeback, tackles Meng. Both go tumbling over the top rope. Referee checks on Meng and Sting corners Colonel Parker and decks him. Meng comes running in, but Sting dodges him. Scorpion deathlock, but Meng powers out of it, which the, with the commentary, rightfully so, puts over in a huge way. How many times have you seen anyone ever power out of the Scorpion Deathlock? Kind of a big moment there. Big top rope splash by Sting in the kick out. Finally, Sting hits a leaping DDT, almost got the same motion as the zigzag, but in DDT form. And he actually finally puts Meng away with that move. I give this match two and a half stars out of four. Not the most exciting match or the most riveting match in the world, but I will give them credit for telling a great story here because Sting is spending the entirety of this matchup just chopping down the Redwood, doing everything he can, trying to capitalize on the the slightest mistake that Meng can commit here just to try and mount an offense and make some kind of fight against the big Tongan fella. So yeah, good story. Uh, Sting's leaping ability, his much vaunted leaping ability is uh, eventually what puts him over the top here and he's the new U.S. champion. So as I mentioned earlier, Hulk Hogan and Vader are nowhere to be seen on the main show for Great American Bash, but who the hell needs them? Because this main event more than makes up for it. It's Ric Flair versus the Macho Man Randy Savage in a great grudge match here. Uh, this thing got very personal between the two of them back at Uncensored. Even if you ignore their history in the World Wrestling Federation before this, uh, things got very personal starting at Uncensored. Now, Flair was kayfabe retired by this point, but he jumps Randy Savage in a match with Avalanche, dressed as a woman, by the way. Then one month later, by the time Flair's been reinstated at Slam Marie, Flair and Arn Anderson violently assault Savage's 70-year-old father, Angelo Poffo, the newly minted WCW Hall of Famer. And so Savage has spent weeks pursuing Flair, just trying to jump him every chance he can get. Like I mentioned, they were supposed to do battle in the U.S. title tournament, but that match was thrown out as a no contest due to their brawl. So nothing on the line here in this match, just pride and ego is at stake. After Macho Man cuts his pre-match promo, he brings his dad, Papa Poffo, to the ring with him. Savage starts out hot, making Flair bounce all over the damn place, a backdrop on the floor to Flair. Flair gets the advantage after an eye rake, even busts out a big axe handle off the apron onto the floor. And these two guys are just scrapping. This match, to me, more than anything else, feels like a fight. Savage is just all over Flair here. He can really put over just the anger and the vitriol he feels toward Flair for what he did to his father. And he's just beating the hell out of Flair every chance he gets. Like, he just, like, dives onto him. He doesn't, like, wait for Flair to get up. He just dives onto him, starts throwing hands. Great Great stuff here. Heenan very interesting on commentary here. He's very like torn between two worlds because like I said, he is the heel commentator. He will favor Flair nine out of ten times because of their history and everything and also because they're heels together. But also he is very conflicted because he says he's known the Poffo family for so long. He's known Randy Savage since he was a little kid because he knew Angelo Poffo and he's very sympathetic to Savage's plight and how he really needs to get at Flair for what he did to Angelo Poffo. So he's definitely kind of playing both sides in this match, probably for the first real time, the first real tangible time in the entire show, which is really good. They're fighting on the outside again, fighting a little too close to Poffo, who's sitting at ringside. Savage goes on to check on him, which allows for a chop block in, working the leg now. Flair gets a figure four locked in, but Savage eventually turns it over. Savage's cheek or his eye somehow gets busted around this time, hits a top rope elbow drop, but in a moment of eager go and too much pride picks Flair up during the count so he could have won it but he chose not to here Savage grabs the ring bell for more damage the referee stops him that allows Flair to roll out of the ring Savage goes for the dive but Flair moves and Savage crashes into the barricade Flair stalks Angelo Poffo but Poffo gets an upper hand on Flair here by choking him out with his cane uh, Flair fights back takes the cane with him he hides it and he decks Savage in the face with it with the referee distracted and uh, Flair pins and wins this incredible grudge match. Not the last time we'll see these two fight, uh, but we're going to talk about more of that at some other time. I give this match three and a half stars out of four. Just a great way to end the show. A great story being told here. The complete opposite of the last three and a half star match in this show, Pillman and Wright, 
It starts strong and it ends strong here with this show, but this one's a complete opposite, but in a, it's such a great way. It's just a big brawl, big, just nasty, vicious fight, and they put it over very well. They have such great chemistry here. And the finish is so familiar, it's so heartbreaking. Savage has the match won, but ultimately his hubris gets the better of him and Flair with the advantage. These two will have a rematch at Bash the Beach 95, which as of right now has not been nominated yet on Patreon. So I really want to cover this match when we get to that, but right now it's just not on the list, so I can't quite cover it yet. My final grade for the return of WCW's Great American Bash is a C grade. Uh, unfortunately, the good of this show is negated by the not so good. Like I mentioned, the show starts strong and it ends strong. Brian Pillman and Alex Wright, great match. Flair versus Savage, great match. And I also enjoyed the uh, WCW tag title match, the Nasty Boys and the Blue Bloods. Also enjoyed Sting versus May. But everything else about this show really dragged it down for me. Like uh, Duggan versus Pittman was kind of a, not that great a match. Uh, the arm wrestling contest, if you want to factor that into the score because it's not even a real match. Uh, the Harlem Heat versus Bunkhouse Buck and Dirty Dick wasn't that great. And also Renegade versus Arn Anderson really drags the grade down to this. And again, I hate to make Arn Anderson culpable in a not so great grade for this classic review. And I just want to give him a hug because he tried so hard, but ultimately he could not pull a good match out of the Renegade here. As you can tell, it's not a pay-per-view in which anything gets resolved. If anything, it sets a lot of things up and just carries things over for Bash the Beach the next month, which will be on the beach. But again, uh, until that gets nominated on Patreon.com, Come, I can't touch it, which I really want to do. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of the Great American Bash 1995. Thanks once again to Daniel Kingman for nominating it for me. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I review, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestling with regret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me in the future. Next time on the Classic Review, in two weeks, we are going to go to one of my most requested pay-per-views yet. It's SummerSlam 2005. Hogan versus Michaels? Oh yeah, I'm all for this. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.